Good morning. <clears throat> it is a real pleasure to be here with you in uh, <clears throat> Arlington. I was going to say DC. <laughs> uh, and this, uh, hope, what we hope will be a beautiful spring day. And uh, just really an honor to be with you at NAEP. Uh, my first time coming to one of your meetings. Um, but as I get familiar with your work, um, I see that we're really uh, very much aligned with the same kinds of goals. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, I'm glad to be uh, part of this event as you think about how to advance the cause of equity uh, in education across the country. Uh, equity is a concept that confuses many people. It confuses many people because uh, they think it's the same as equality, but it's really not. It's not about treating all children the same. It's about understanding that our kids come with a host of uh, differences and unique uh, dispositions and backgrounds and personalities. And it's really a focus on outcomes and results, despite the differences. Um, I often say that most parents practice equity with their children, if you have more than one at least. Right? I have five, <laughs> and I have to practice equity. And one of the things I know, anybody else have more than one? There's several of you out there with a few, right? Uh, is you know they're not all the same. All right, so I spend more money on the second one than I do on the others. That's because she's a single mom and she needs more help from me, right? Uh, <clears throat> The first one walked at nine months. I was very proud of that, even though I had nothing to do with it, but I still took pride in his walking early. The fourth one didn't walk till she was about 15 months. We were worried, because uh, we thought that she was uh, gonna crawl forever, but she's walking, they're all walking fine now. They're walking all over the place. <laughs> so that's one thing. If, even if they don't achieve average yearly progress in walking, right, it's gonna be okay, right? The fifth one, she's really special. She has an extensive vocabulary. She's only two. She has uh, over 500 words. She does sign language. She does yoga. We thought for sure she was gifted, except she has one real shortcoming. She hits other kids. <laughs> and we're working on that, you know, on how to not be so aggressive. Uh, but my point is that they're all different, right? And as a parent, you know that your responsibility is to make sure that each one of them gets to thrive and achieve their potential, regardless of what difficulties life may throw at them. Right? That's our responsibility as a parent. <clears throat> when I, ha were, I had two of them, the, the fourth, no, the third and the fourth, when they used to, I used to take them to school, they're only a year and a half apart. The, my son, who was older, would want to hold my hand longer because he was shy when we got to school. Whereas his little sister would be, bye-bye, I'm off to go play. I held his hand longer not because I loved him anymore, but because as a parent I understood that he needed that extra time. Some kids need extra time. Some kids aren't going to talk as fast or read as fast as other kids. And if some kids come to us not speaking English as their first language, they may take even longer to acquire English, particularly in science and math. What we've got to be clear about is that excellence is possible for all kinds of kids, right, despite the difference. I'm working on a book right now with a colleague called Excellence Through Equity. We're doing the book because we believe that too often, excellence and equity is, are pitted against each other. That is, there's an assumption that if you're promoting excellence, it means you can't do equity. And that's the reason why in many districts and many schools, when you look at who's in advanced placement, when you look at who's in gifted and talented classes, you only find the most privileged children. I say there's a fundamental empirical problem with that. Not, a, not merely a political problem, but an empirical problem. The empirical problem is this, we know there's talent out there. We know there's talent in the trailer parks, isn't there? Do you believe me? And in the housing projects? Right? And in single parent households? And in immigrant homes? And in homes with only one parent? Or even a child being raised by a grandparent? Or in foster care? Or in a homeless shelter? The talent is out there. However, sometimes that talent doesn't get developed 
because it isn't even recognized. Because too often our schools are really focused on measuring ability as it shows up and then sorting accordingly. And those who come with the most privileges almost always outshine those with less, don't they? We've got to change the whole paradigm in education if we're really going to pursue equity to move away from measuring and sorting to cultivating talent in all kinds of children. And to do that, I'm going to describe 10 principles that I think are essential. I would say right now, our basketball coaches, our football coaches, they know how to get talent out of the trailer parks, don't they? Right. Or out of the housing projects. Why? Because we love sports. If we love science and math as we did, as much as we did uh, baseball, I mean uh, football and basketball, we could get all kinds of talent out of those communities as well. And so we've got to not only shift the paradigm, we've got to change the practices we use if we're going to make this happen. So I want to start, though, by drawing your attention to a study that was done at the University of Chicago <coughs> a few years ago. And it's compiled in a book called Organizing Schools for Improvement. And Anthony Breich, the author of the study, and his colleagues said there, they looked at 10 years of reform in Chicago, and the question they asked, why did some schools get better and some schools not? And what they found is that the key to sustained improvement was five essential ingredients. I want you to look at this list and then think about your schools, your districts that you work with and ask, are we working to ensure that those five ingredients are present? First, there's got to be a coherent instructional guidance system. Why? Because you can't expect teachers to work in isolation and understand what good teaching looks like by their, on their own. In so many schools, there's such unevenness in the quality of teaching, isn't there? You can go to one classroom and find excellent teaching right next door to someone who's very mediocre. So he said there's got to be a support system in place. He said, secondly, there's got to be an ongoing attention to developing the professional skills of educators. Because there's got to be a match between the needs of the kids and the skills of the educators. Anytime you see an achievement gap, what you really are seeing is a mismatch between the needs of the children and the skills of the educators. If you see kids that can't read, you know what it means? It means you have teachers that can't teach reading. If you see kids, English language learners that are not learning English, it means you have teachers that don't know how to teach English language learners. There's a direct connection. But a lot of times we don't see that connection. Instead what we do is we blame the kids or their parents for why they're not performing and not doing what we expect. Third, it says it's got to be strong parent community ties. And we've known this for years, haven't we? Over 50% of student achievements influenced by what parents do. And when there's reinforcement at home, children do better academically. And when communities are involved in supporting their schools, so that schools are not doing it by themselves, but they, there's help. There's mentors if the school needs it. There's a health clinic if the school needs it. If there's clothing for the kids in the winter if they need clothing. That those ties also have an impact on student learning because we're not just focused on achievement, we're focused on child development. And those of us who remember Abraham Maslow, remember that there's a hierarchy of human needs. And at the base of that hierarchy is the need every child has for safety, for health, for nutrition, and for love. All you have to do right now is look at the kids who are not achieving your district and I will bet you will find unmet needs that have not been addressed. Unmet, often non-academic needs. And in many districts there's no strategy to address those. Fourth, it says it's got to be a student-centered learning climate. That's about a culture of beliefs, of attitudes, values, norms that are conducive to learning. Schools where the kids believe it's cool to be smart. Schools where the adults collaborate together and challenge each other and encourage each other and push each other. Schools that are safe. 
physically and psychologically and emotionally safe places to be because you can't learn in an unsafe environment, can you? And to tie it all together, you've got to have leadership that drives change. Leadership that has a vision, but leadership that most importantly is able to generate a sense of buy-in, a sense of team and community amongst the staff because it's not just about one person doing this. It's about the ability to get a school to be greater than the sum of its parts. It's that each member of the team, whether the custodian or the guidance counselor or the school nurse or the person in the lunchroom giving out lunches, every member of the team understands why they're there, what this mission is about and works together to achieve those goals. Now what the study found is those schools exist in Chicago, and I would say right now we have evidence they exist in this country as well. And I'll describe those schools. Schools where a child's background does not predict how well they will do academically. The existence of those schools is all the proof we need to know the problem is not the children. The problem is our inability to create those conditions in schools. And so the first challenge to you when you go back to your districts is what are we talking about when we start thinking about equity? Are we talking about changing kids or changing the environment in which they learn? If we're not focused on changing the environment, then we're focused on the wrong thing. Under the right conditions, all kinds of kids can learn. Autistic kids or kids on the spectrum, English language learners, kids with <clears throat> difficult circumstances at home, under the right conditions. The real question is how to create those conditions. So now let me describe some of those practices and principles that have to be present. The first is you've got to be able to challenge the assumptions about why kids may or may not be performing. And you've got to challenge the assumptions because we live in a society where stereotypes about race, about culture, about socioeconomic status often inform what we expect of children. And if you're at a school or working in a district, particularly a district that's gone through demographic change, how many of you are in a district like that? It's gone through, seen some recent changes. Very often the educators complain because they say, you know, we were fine until those kids came. They're bringing us down. Right? They're bringing us down. Right? And what they're, they're waiting for the other kids to come back. Guess what? They're not coming back. Right? And first thing they need to realize is they better be happy those kids are there because those kids are keeping them employed. Right? But second of all, those kids require new skills. But the fact of the matter is, even if they have the old kids, they require new skills. Because education is not a static field. Education is a dynamic field. And if we are not constantly renewing our knowledge, renewing our skills, we become obsolete and education becomes stagnant. The children today are not like the children of 20 years ago. They're not even like the children of 10 years ago. The average middle school student is more comfortable with technology than the average teacher. Right? You get a new smartphone, what do you got to do? Give it to a child. <laughs> they will download new apps, teach you how to use that phone. We are still, in too many schools, blaming children for conditions kids do not create. And so the question is, what's the conversation like in your district? What are they talking about? If they're blaming kids and blaming parents, they're focused on the wrong things. We've got to focus on the things we do control, not the things we don't control. And so the first challenge to creating a, a, a system where equity and excellence can be reconciled, can be achieved simultaneously, is making sure we are holding each other accountable. And that includes parents and children as well. But it's very importantly mutual. Right now in many districts, in many states, we have top-down accountability. Right? The people in charge hold everybody else accountable, except for themselves. And I mean the governor and the state legislature. Now, we may not be able to do a whole lot about that, although I'm glad you're going to Washington to lobby. Right? But at least at the district level, we've got to make sure, because in a lot of districts, you, know, you have superintendents and people in the central office who don't recognize that their job is not merely to scrutinize and judge. Their job is to help. 
Their job is to collaborate with the schools. It should be that when someone from the central office shows up at the school, people are happy to see you. Because they know that you come to help them problem solve, not merely to scrutinize and tell them what a bad job they're doing. And so we've got to change the dynamics in how we work if we're going to change outcomes. Secondly, someone's got to be a guardian for equity. Someone's got to be willing to stand up. Someone's got to be willing to speak out. And the reason why is because inequity is more powerful than equity, much more powerful. Because all the forces in our society are toward inequity. Look what's happening with wages. Look what's happening with the distribution of wealth. It is actually weakening this country because we have more and more Americans who are living at or just above the poverty line. Many, many what we used to call middle class families that are barely making it. College becoming increasingly inaccessible for families because the costs go up way faster than our incomes. And those same societal pressures are showing up in our schools. Right now, if you talk to a lot of affluent families, they no longer rely on the guidance counselor for uh, help with college, right? Who do they go to for help with college? Teachers. Teachers. Private companies. They go to private companies that they pay lots of money to who coach their kids through the entire process. I have a good friend of mine who's a doctor, who retired being a doctor because that's what he does now. He coaches families. He, he gets, he gets, he gets, I get twice as much coaching families through college as I do, as I did as a doctor. I have another former student. He gets paid thousands and thousands of dollars a year to train four-year-olds to pass the exams needed to get into elite private schools in New York City. And you know where he got his training from? He was a specialist in working with autistic children. He said, guess what, if I could teach an autistic child, I could teach any child. And he can. But that's a private resource now, not available to all those other kids that need that help. So what happens to the kids who do need a guidance counselor? But if the guidance counselor is seeing 200, 300 kids, what's the ratio in California right now? 500 to a counselor. What does that mean? Are counselors, are they actually counseling? Probably not. They're doing a lot more scheduling, if that. Right. Then who's doing the counseling? Who's helping our kids to navigate the financial aid process? Right. You need staff who are willing to speak up and talk about kids who have been denied opportunities. I was at a district in New Jersey that I won't name, talking to principals there about the importance of, of educators exercising courage to speak out for kids that you know are not being well served. And a brand new principal, they said, well, I've seen an example of what you described. <clears throat> I said, well, why don't you share it with the group? He said, well, I'm new here. And I got to the high school and I noticed that every time the bell rang, there was a group of African-American boys that lingered in the hallway. And everybody seemed fine with it and they weren't going to class. And I said, I'm going to put a stop to it. So I decided I was going to usher these boys off to class and I started taking them to class and I found out they were all going to class in the basement. And I didn't know we held classes in the basement. And that's when I learned that the special ed classes were all being held in the basement and there was no learning going on at all. They were just playing down there and they were embarrassed to be going to the basement because everybody knew the dumb kids were in the basement. And then in front of the entire group he says, I think it's time to take them out of the basement. And people looked away like they didn't know what he was talking about because everybody knew they were in the basement. They'd been in the basement for years. Everybody knew that those kids were not only in the basement, but not learning anything, even though they had IEPs. Right. Who's in your best district's basement? And if it's not a literal basement, maybe it's a bungalow out back. Or maybe it's just that classroom where they have deliberately assigned a teacher that you know and everyone else knows is incompetent. If we're not willing to call that out, if we're not willing to do something about it, nothing will change. Nothing will change. Equity requires that we have uncomfortable conversations sometimes, where we hold each other accountable for what's going on. Where we look at student outcomes and ask. Right now, we've got so much attention, growing attention for good reason, on the high rate of suspension in many school districts. And that's because in so many schools, we are reflexively just suspending kids without ever asking what's behind the behavior problem. Right. 
So we need different kind of practices, but we most of all need people who are willing to speak up about what's happening in our schools if we're going to change outcomes for kids. So <clears throat> the third principle is about immigrant kids and their rights. Right now what we're seeing across the country is that immigrant kids are overrepresented amongst our highest achievers and our most at-risk students. They're on both ends. You go to any of the Ivy League schools right now, you go to any of the University of California system, any of the elite universities in the country, you will find a disproportionate number of the undergraduates are immigrant students, and not just from Asia. They're from Africa, they're from Latin America, they're from Eastern Europe. But these are the immigrant kids who come to this country literate in their native language, who often have parents who are well-educated. So they will learn English quickly because they use their primary language to acquire that second language and they take off because they often have superior math and science skills than American kids. But then there's the other side of the spectrum. The immigrant kids whose parents are cleaning houses and doing the dirty work in this country who are not literate in their native language, who are often in bilingual classes that neither teach Spanish nor English. Those are the kids who often drop out of school in droves. You know what the research shows? The number one reason why they drop out? Anybody want to guess? They drop out to work. Right? They drop out to work because they can see the writing on the wall. They have a strong work ethic, but they can see the college is not attainable and especially if they're undocumented, may not even be possible. And so those kids are dropping out in droves, but they're also relegating themselves to low-wage labor almost permanently. Immigrant kids will do as well as they're treated in our schools. I'm working with a district right now in Long Island where they have produced excellent results for immigrant kids. Why? Because they not only serve their needs in their bilingual classes, but in science and math. They've got teachers who can teach across content areas to English language learners. And not surprisingly, kids do much better. So we need to ask ourselves, when we look at our immigrant populations and we look at the patterns in the data, what do they reveal about the strengths and the capacities of our staff? And we need to also be mindful of this. Immigrant children are learning a new culture, even as they learn a new language. And they are often assimilating much more quickly than their parents do. And as they assimilate and become American, they often become estranged from their parents. The parents who still have the old ways, the parents who still don't speak English. Many immigrant families, the children become the one who negotiate with the school. The children are negotiating with the landlord, negotiating with other authorities creates an imbalance of power in a family and often results in parents losing control over their children. I was doing a workshop for a group of Vietnamese parents in San Francisco. I was explaining the importance of them being involved in their children's education. I saw one mother getting very upset. I said, what's wrong? She said, I'm a garment worker. She said, I work 10 hour days and now you tell me I have to be involved at school. She said, I thought they were professionals. I'm not a professional educator. I thought they were professionals. I thought they should know what to do. I said, well, you have a good point. I said, but in this country, when parents aren't attentive to what happens to their children, sometimes their children don't get what they deserve. Isn't it sad to have to say that to a parent? <laughs> like they can't just trust the schools. <laughs> right. But what's more, this parent said, I think these schools are telling the kids not to respect us. Because the longer my kid goes to school, the less respectful he becomes. Now, it's kind of sad too, isn't it? That part of the assimilation <laughs> that's happening is that they become more and more strange in the family. Now, those of us who've raised teenagers know that that's not simply an immigrant phenomenon, right? <laughs> that happens to all kinds of teenagers, right? But we've got to work with parents for immigrant kids because if the parents lose influence over their children, the children become more vulnerable, more at risk. And in many of our communities, there's a high rate of gang involvement amongst immigrant youth. And that partially comes from kids who become disconnected, who have to seek out support systems elsewhere. So we've got to be attentive to both the academic and the social needs of these children if they're going to be successful. <clears throat> the fourth principle is we've got to provide clear guidance to kids on what success looks like. 
We've got to give kids examples of excellent work. The real learning occurs not in the first submission, does it? It occurs in the revision. It occurs in understanding what I did wrong so that I can produce and, and aim for what the standard is. I always tell schools, you should eliminate Ds. Because a D means you don't know. And a D should mean you should do it over. Because if you still have Ds, what will happen? Kids will aim for Ds, won't they? I passed. We should be much more focused on mastery than we do. We need to provide our kids with clear evidence of excellent work. Teachers should be able to show kids this is what it looks like if you do it right. We need to give our kids clear goals and help them develop clear goals, especially kids who come from families where neither parent have gone to college. One of my colleagues, Kristen Lucas, done work on teen pregnancy. The question she asks is, why is it that middle class girls are less likely to have babies as teenagers than low income girls? And what she finds is the answer is not about sex. Though clearly sex is involved. <laughs> the big difference is college. If you think you're going to college, you think having a baby at 15 is not a good idea. If you come from a family where both your parents or one, your mother had a child at 15, it starts to seem like this is normal. If we want to break the cycle of failure, we've got to give kids something clear and concrete to aim for. Here's what we know. Kids who think they're going somewhere behave differently than kids who think they're going nowhere. Your aspirations influence the decisions you make. Because again, who's, who's helping kids think about college? I asked my students at NYU, when did you first decide you were going to college? One kid raised his hand, he said, I think from the time my parents, my mother got pregnant, I was going to college. <laughs> I said, why do you say that? She said, because she told me, she put my name on a list for the, a preschool, and they started saving money for college. They were planning from the time she was pregnant. Right. Kids who come from families where neither parent have gone to college, May not wait, the senior year, maybe, they start thinking about it. Puts them at a huge disadvantage, doesn't it? If we know those disadvantages are there, then we've got to work backwards to say, okay, what do we do to try to reduce some of these disadvantages? We can never reduce them completely. But we can try to compensate. Homework is an equity issue, isn't it? You ever see some of those kids, they bring in that diorama, it looks like a, an architect did it? Then you find out their dad's an architect. <laughs> he was up all night with them doing the, the diorama. Right? How many of you have kids that you spend a lot of time in their homework? Ready to be honest now. Okay. A lot of time in their homework. Well, guess what? Suppose you have a parent that can't help with homework because they're too busy working or doesn't speak the language or doesn't have enough education to be able to help. And you don't have a computer at home. And you may not even have a place to get the homework done because there's too many people living in the house. We punish kids sometimes for conditions that kids don't control. And I'm not saying get rid of homework. I am going to say, though, that we should at least acknowledge some of the disadvantages kids bring. And if we know there are some kids who need more support, then we've got to find ways to provide the extra support. The most effective homework is work that begins in class with the teacher present and then is reinforced at home. Anytime teachers are assigning new work for homework, they're setting kids up. They're setting kids up because we know there's no one at home to help them with those, those challenging problems. So we need to think about our practices. Most teachers never get any training on how to assign homework. Never. It's as if we assume that they just know it. Most teachers get no training on how to assign grades. Some people grade for attitude. You ever see people grade for attitude? They grade for attendance. Some kids, how do you recover from a zero? If you got a zero on one of the first tests, a zero. Now you're going to fail. Should you keep trying if you know you're going to fail? We've got to think differently about our practices if we want to keep kids engaged. And we want to, in fact, get them to apply themselves. So a lot of this has to do with how we engage and work with kids. And part of that engagement is also recognize that kids who are not white and middle class, 
will also have to become multilingual, multicultural. It's unfair, but it's true, isn't it? They've got to learn when the standard English required. How do I dress for that job interview? When is it time to pull up my pants? Why? If I don't learn those things, what happens? People are making judgments about me all the time based on how I look, how I speak. It might have nothing to do at all with my intelligence. It has everything to do with the images in their head of who they think I am. And if they think I look like a thug, they may not hire me or admit me to the program. And if you don't have teachers that are willing to tell a child, you know what, you need to pull up your pants. And here's the reason why. It's not just about t putting them down for how they dress and how they speak. It's about explaining what Lisa Delpit calls the codes of power. Right. The codes of power. Because we want our kids to be empowered to navigate any situation, whether it be a job interview or a, a, a eating in a nice restaurant or wherever. They want, should be able to go anywhere with the education that they're provided. But for that to happen, the educators need to not just prepare them for tests, they need to prepare them for life and recognize that that's part of the learning that kids need to get to. Otherwise, they will be at a huge disadvantage. Fifth principle is we've got to build partnerships with parents of all kinds. Got to work with parents. As I said already, it shows up in the other research on the ingredients, the essential, the essential ingredients of school improvement. It shows up, think about your highest achieving kids. They all have parent support, don't they? It's very rare to meet a parent, a child who does well, who has no parental support. They make movies about those kids. I know one of them, Liz Murray. They made a movie about her, from homeless to Harvard. It's true. Her parents were drug addicts, and she still found a way to make it to Harvard. It's a harrowing story of what she went through, but she got through it. Awfully resilient. Most kids are not that nearly that resilient. Most of the kids that are doing well have some parent behind them pushing. So what does that tell us? It tells us we've got to find ways to get more parents involved in the lives of their kids. The good news is this. Most parents want to see their children succeed, don't they? They do. I rarely meet parents who say, you know, I like my child to fail. I want them to end up unemployed and living with me for the rest of their life. You know? <laughs> most parents don't want that. But most schools do not know how to talk to parents, particularly if they're from a different background. Do not how to engage them as partners and in a respectful conversation that's not premised on patronizing advice, but on empathy. Empathy is not the same as pity, is it? And empathy is important. I always say as a parent, when I talk to other parents, I always start with, I understand. I understand how hard it is to raise kids. I understand how hard it is to get them to do what we'd like them to do. Anybody here have perfect kids? Okay. You want to? <laughs> all right. Then we should all understand. Right. And understanding means that we can now talk about how we can work together to help our kids to be successful. Because if we get parents and teachers working together to support kids, we have a much better chance of improving outcomes. That's what James Coleman found in his research on schools, that when there's reinforcement at school for what's happening at home, children do better academically. So that's the key. Parents will either, parents always matter. They will either be your biggest ally or your biggest problem. You've got to find a way to make them an ally, a resource for your schools. Sixth principle is that we've got to align our discipline practices with our educational goals. This is the reason why it's so important to rethink suspension. Why would we think in the first place that sending kids home to watch television would be an effective form of discipline? I go to schools that are suspending the same kids over and over again and no one is stopping to ask, why isn't this working? They're just doing it out of habit. I was at a school in Cleveland. I'm sitting down meeting with the principal. The little boy gets in, comes in an eighth grader. He says, you've been cutting. You're going to get three days suspension. The boy looks at him and says, okay. Give me five days this time. <laughs> he said, all right, smart Al, you can get five days. He writes it up. I'm watching. I said, do you think this is going to change his cutting? He said, not at all. He says, get him out of my hair for five days. Ask yourself now, how are we using discipline? If we're not using discipline to change behavior, we're probably using it to get push kids out onto the streets. 
Pushing kids out into the streets actually contributes to delinquency. Right. Changing behavior requires a different set of strategies. You know what the punishment should be for not doing your work? More work. Right. That's right. Punishment for not going to class should be more class. Saturday school now. Right. Ask the kids. They'd rather go home and watch. Send me to watch TV, please. Right. We've got to think about this as we would our own kids. How many of you, if your child had broken curfew, say, okay, don't come home for three days now. <laughs> I don't see you for three days. That's not how we do it. We take away privilege, take away the cell phone, take away the internet. Right? Works with kids in school, too. And we also got to know this. The kids who are still connected to education will be the kids that are least likely to get in trouble, who care. So what does that mean? We've got to keep making education matter for kids. Because the kids that are hardest to discipline are the kids who've given up. So we've got to address the underlying causes of discipline problems and focus on the moral and character development of children. Lawrence Kohlberg said, the goal of discipline is not to teach kids to avoid punishment. It's to teach kids to do what's right even when we're not looking. The U.S. Department of Education put out a study last week or two weeks ago showing that we were, we were suspending kids in this country, African-American kids, in preschool, in large numbers. We need to really ask tough questions. And it's not to say that we want to put up with disorderly, chaotic environments, but we want to be much more creative in how we address discipline problems in our schools. I could spend a lot more time on this, but it is really amounting to a denial of learning opportunities for kids when they're out on, out on the streets or at home watching television. So we need to make sure that discipline is really um, focused on changing behavior. <clears throat> we need to rethink everything we do in the name of remediation. For so long, we would take the kids who were behind and put them in a group with other kids that are behind and sign a teacher that's behind and then say, let's see you catch up now. Now we made it nice and slow. And they never do, do they? No, they stay behind. We have great research now that what we've really got to do is we've got to personalize learning. We've got to do a much better job at diagnosing where the learning obstacles are. We've got to find ways to get them extra time, more time, because you need more time if you're going to catch up, not less. And it's not about watering down or lowering standards, but making standards accessible, right? High standards accessible to kids. I work with in Modesto. I know some folks here from California. <coughs> Henshaw Middle School. School, 95% recent immigrants from Mexico. Had been a blue ribbon school for over 13 years. All kids in eighth grade take algebra. Kids who are not ready for that intense algebra class in eighth grade, they get double period algebra and no homework. Do homework in class. And a really strong teacher. They don't lower the standards, they make the standards accessible. What are we doing to make high standards accessible to more kids? Again, this has to be reflected in our practices. <clears throat> there are 38 performance assessment schools in New York City. They use assessment differently than the other schools. They, kids actually have to produce work that demonstrates what they've learned. My daughter went to a school like that, School of the Future in Manhattan. There are only three grades possible on an exhibition, distinction, Competence or do-over. Right. Failure is not an option. You work on the exhibition with the teacher all year long. It's an iterative process. You revise, resubmit. Revise, meet, resubmit. She did her ninth grade history project on the Roman and the Inca Empire. She had to explain how they rose, why they eventually collapsed. She had to compare and contrast political and economic systems, culture, religion. She had to have multiple sources, a well-developed thesis statement. By the end of the year, as a ninth grader, she's produced a 25-page research paper. And then she has to present that paper to teachers, students, and parents. Every student in the school has that same requirement in every content area. High standards made accessible with lots of support. What the research shows, kids from schools like that less likely to have to take remedial courses in college. If you can write a 25-page research paper as a ninth grader, you're going to probably be able to do it fine and come college. 
So this is not about watering it down. Eighth principle, we need <coughs> evidence-based practices to evaluate what we're doing. So many schools I know of that have tried reforms. I had a, a teacher the other day, she said, what do you think of bilingual education? I said, I think it's great. She said, really? I said, when implemented correctly. She said, oh. <laughs> right? When you implement anything badly, usually it's bad, isn't it? I have so many schools, they said, oh, we, we tried advisories. It didn't work. Because they did it badly. <laughs> right? It became a study hall. Right? Another school I talked to, they, they said, we tried block scheduling. Teachers got tired. I said, why? It's because they were just talking for longer now. No, that's not the point of block scheduling. You do structural changes to facilitate changes in pedagogy. There are so many examples in schools right now that take, we invest so much on reforms and so little on preparing teachers to implement the reform. That's what worries me about the Common Core. You know? We think that there's a silver bullet. If the real potential of the Common Core is in the ability of teachers to teach the higher order thinking skills to kids that the standards should allow. If they come out with new workbooks that are Common Core aligned, forget it. It'll be more of the same, just worse. And so we've got to make sure there's fidelity to implementation. That's the big problem with special education, isn't it? If special education work, we should all want our children in special ed, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we? We should be lining up. Because that child has an individualized plan. Someone knows exactly what your child needs, and they're going to make sure they get it. Except we know in many districts that's not how it works, is it? There's no fidelity. And the longer they're placed, the further behind they fall. And in fact, many of the children who've been identified don't really have a disability. They have something called ABT. Have you heard of ABT? It's a new one. Ain't been taught. That's what they're suffering from. <laughs> and not being taught long enough will produce a real disability, right? So that kids will not know how to read, not because they can't, but because they haven't been taught. So fidelity to implementation, quality control, evaluation in Title I programs, all these things have to be part of our efforts to ensure equity and excellence in what we're doing. The ninth principle is we've got to build partnerships, particularly in high-need, high-poverty communities and schools. Schools can't do it all by themselves. Some schools need a partner with a clinic or with a food pantry or with a church if they need for tutors or with a business for internships, or with a college and university for tutors, and for professional development for, for teachers. We've got to be resourceful. And the schools that are able to do this are able to build capacity in schools so that teachers can focus more narrowly on the academics because there's a support system in place to address the other things that kids need. This is about capacity building in schools. And it would be great if our state departments of education were doing this work, but I know a few states that are doing it. I know of cities that are now doing it, thinking comprehensively about this. Work with Tulsa, Oklahoma, where they already have universal pre-K. And where they're now, anybody from Oklahoma? All right, they've had, they've had uh, the, the, Oklahoma has more kids in quali high quality pre-K than any state in the country. All right. Let's hear it for Oklahoma. <laughs> I was speaking to the National Governors Association and I pointed that out and the Oklahoma, governor of Oklahoma was very shaking his head proud and I said, what made Oklahoma decide to do that? And he said, well, we've seen the research. So I turned to the other governors, I guess, I said, you guys must not have seen the research on <laughs> the importance of this early childhood education. I guess it's getting out there now and more and more people are talking about it. But the fact of the matter is that we've got to think comprehensively about kids' needs from from, the, from birth all the way through, about the academic, the emotional, the physical needs, they all come in the same package. And when we address the developmental needs of kids, we will also see their achievement rise. So we need to think is holistically. And, and what really worries me is that in too many districts I see, in the name of raising achievement, we're taking everything away from kids that's not on the test. Right? You know, so science not on the test, science gets cut. Phys Ed is definitely not on the test. Phys Ed gets cut, even though obesity, number one health problem for our children. Art, music, definitely not on the test. Double period literacy, double period math. 
So I saw a study that said that eating lunch was good for test scores, and I said, thank God. <laughs> thank God, they might take lunch too. But our kids, let's face it, they need a well-rounded education that includes lunch and science and PE and recess. They need it all. all right, so we need to combat that tendency too to narrowly focus on our kids' needs. Career and technical education is taking a beating because of that narrow focus, hasn't it? In many of our districts. And high quality technical preparation is a way to ensure that not only kids are job ready, but in many cases also college ready if we do it right. Lastly, we need to, and this is probably the most radical idea of all if we're gonna promote equity and excellence. We need to insist that we teach the kids the way they learn rather than expecting them to learn the way we teach. Think about the difference. Read my colleague Jeff Duncan's book called, what a, uh, Jeff Andrade's book, What a Coach Can Teach a Teacher. Because coaches, theater teachers, music teachers, vocational teachers, all teach with a focus on performance. When you teach with a focus on performance, you understand that it's not simply about covering the material. You're constantly looking for evidence that the child is acquiring this skill. Right? And you're breaking it down for them to help them understand the intricate parts of that skill. So if a child can't shoot free throws, you watch them shoot. You look at the form and you make them shoot over and over again. If the kid doesn't know his lines, you don't put him up on stage till that kid has memorized and rehearsed those lines. You break it down to its parts. Because the shop teacher, the basketball coach, the, the music teacher all get it. The performance of the kids reflects back on them as teachers. Well, we got to get our math teachers to understand that too. And our science teachers and our history teachers. That teaching and talking are not the same thing. That covering the material is not the same as teaching the material. You're only teaching it if there's evidence that kids are learning it. And the evidence has to show up, not on the standardized test, although that's one marker, it's in the work they produce each and every day. And the most powerful professional development, how many of you are doing this now, bringing together small groups of teachers to analyze student work? Few of you. Let's hope that next year everybody's got their hand up. Because when you bring the work into the room, the connections between teaching and learning become very clear. And you know what else becomes clear? Some teachers are producing better work out of kids than others. And instead of that being an opportunity for name calling, that should be an opportunity for sharing. How come your kids can write those essays? My kids can't. Why were your kids willing to read the book? My kids didn't. Those kinds of conversations amongst the educators change teaching and change outcomes for kids. So let me just say, ex excellence and equity can be reconciled. Let me give you one example. Brockton High School. Brockton High School, Massachusetts, the largest high school in the state, over 4,000 students. And it's the only urban district in the state of Massachusetts that gets a level one rating. All the other level one schools are very affluent communities. How did Brockton get there? Well, in 2000, in the year 2000, when Massachusetts was announced that it would implement its high stakes exams, it was projected that 70% of the kids at Brockton High School would fail and would be denied diplomas. So a group of veteran teachers got together went to the principal and said, the only way our kids will be prepared to pass the exam is if every teacher is trained in literacy. Because these kids are coming into high school, reading at a third and fourth grade level, they will have no chance, they can't pass the math exam because it requires high level of literacy. So the, the principal, Sue Satchworth, said, I think that's a great idea, but I can't make them do it. I don't have the money, I don't have the means to make them do this. She said, the, the teacher said, we will train our colleagues. And so on their own prep periods, after school, weekends, they started training their colleagues. They couldn't require anybody, so they just got the, those who were willing to go along at first. So when the exams were first administered in 2002, 60% of the kids at Brockton passed. That got everybody's attention because they far outpaced what was expected. So more teachers agreed to be trained. And they trained them in the content. They trained math literacy for math teachers, science literacy for science teachers, got PE teachers trained. 2006, 80% of the kids passed. By 2011, 96% of the kids passed. One third of the senior class got the highest possible score, which qualifies them for the Adams Scholarship, which is a, a scholarship at any public university in the state of Massachusetts for four years. They've gotten the same results for the last three years in a row. 
That third, one-third African-American, one-third Hispanic, one-third low-income white. They are demonstrating that even in a very large high school, it is possible to create a school where a child's background does not predict outcomes, where kids can, in fact, be put on a path to college, despite the fact they come from an old, industrial, working-class community. If you can do that in Brockton, you can do that anywhere in America. It's a question of having the right priorities and staying focused on the right work. I believe that equity and excellence can be combined. I believe that this is work that will, in fact, contribute towards a more equitable nation. And if you're concerned about the future of our nation, then we need to be more urgent in how we approach this work. Because the future of our country will be determined by what happens in our schools. So I appreciate all of you for being on the front lines of this work, and I thank you for your time this morning.